Welcome everyone to another lecture, 2.05, effective temperature on the gas phase rate constants. And suppose in a reaction between gases, we had 10 to the 30 collisions every second. That's an enormous number of collisions. If every single collision yielded a product molecule, the rate would be 1.7 times 10 to the 6 moles of product per second, an enormously large yield. Now, where did that number come from? Well, we know how many particles there are in a mole. So if we divide the number of collisions by the number of particles in a mole, you end up with this number of moles of products every second. Well, clearly, that number is much smaller than you would get if every collision resulted in a successful reaction. So many, many collisions between molecules happen without successful reactions. It's actually 10 billion times slower than if all the collisions were successful. Only a fraction of these collisions result in chemical reactions. So let's just take a look at a hypothetical system here, a model of one. So what we have is a mixture of, of uh, A, which is single atoms and molecules of BC. We have a counter over here that shows us the relative number of molecules and, and atoms of A and BC. We can see right now there's no successful collisions happening. Most of the collisions, they don't have enough energy. So if you look at an energy curve here, the average amount of energy that the molecules has is if it's not sufficient to create a successful reaction. We're not breaking any bonds and we're not forming any new bonds between the uh, reactant, reacting particles. So what can we do to get it to increase? So what we can do, okay, let's see what happens when we raise the temperature. We'll raise the temperature, particles start moving faster, more energy, and have we got any collisions yet? Again, I'm looking over here, I can see still no successful collisions. So uh, a successful collision, a couple of successful collisions. So again, we can raise the temperature and you can see the particles move faster, there's more collisions, increasing the probability that particles are moving fast enough with enough speed and hit at the right angle to actually break chemical bonds, form new chemical bonds. So if I raise the temperature still more, again, we see there are two mo uh, molecules of AB, two of C, and then raise it some more, see what happens. Again, you see that the vast majority of collisions do not result in successful reactions. So if I start increasing the number of particles, let's see what happens. Okay, I've just increased BC. Well, there's no A left. So if there's no A left in the container to react, or very little A in the container, we're not gonna increase the rate much. But now, let's start in injecting more A into the container. So there's six molecules, six atoms of A. So you can see that now you can go into the container, inject more, and now we see significant number of bond breaking and bond making. So, and if we lower it, the molecules slow down. You don't see a whole lot of change happening over here now. Okay, just wanted to show you that simulation. So, continuing on, the rates of reactions in the gaseous state are closely related to temperature as we just saw. A 10 degree increase in temperature approximately doubles the rate of a chemical reaction. So, temperature changes the value of rate constants. So, Approximately, how much would the rate change if I change the temperature of a reaction mixture from 10 degrees to 40 degrees? Well, if we say it doubles with every 10 degrees, this is going to double three different times. So a doubling once is a rate of two, a doubling twice is a rate of four, and a doubling three is a rate of eight. So we'd expect with those three doubling phases, two to the power of three, it will increase by eight times. Now, for um, many, or if not all, chemical reactions, reaction rate constants and temperature are related by Arrhenius's equation for reaction rate constant K. 
So K is equal to A, where A is Arrhenius's constant. It's related to the size and shape of molecules. And it also, when we multiply it, the constant equals Arrhenius is constant multiplied by E to the power of EA. Now EA is the activation energy. It's the amount of energy required for a successful reaction to occur, divided by R, the gas law constant, divided by the temperature in Kelvin. So now if we take the natural log of both sides, and again, there's a product here. So we're gonna be adding those natural logs, the ln of A and the ln of E, the power minus activation energy over the uh, R to T and the ln of K on the left. We now can take one, uh, one uh, over T out of this equation here. And we have a derived equation that's ln of K equals minus EA over R times one over T plus ln A. Now, the reason why we've done that is to simply express this equation in the form y equals mx plus b again a very useful form so if we'd make a graph of the ln of k on the y-axis for y and the 1 over t on the x-axis we would get a straight line because we have a linear relationship y equals mx plus b so if again if we plot those the natural logarithm of K and uh, an inverse of the temperature, you get a linear relationship that is going downward, which is gonna give us a negative slope. So again, if it's Y equals MX plus B, M, the slope of that particular straight line is minus EA over R. Since we know R, we now can figure out EA, the activation energy required for a successful reaction to occur. Very useful. And here's an example of what a, a ln k versus one over t looks like, a linear slope. So the characteristics of the graph, it's a straight line. As we said, the slope is the, uh, the minus value, the ox uh, activation energy divided by r. And a is a constant that is different for every type of molecule. Depends on the size and shape of the molecule. So it's, it's specific to the actual substance. So now we're gonna look at a experimentally derived rate expression for a reaction of, of uh, NH2OH, and it's reacting with O2. And we can see the overall rate is given to us. It's K times the concentration of NH2OH times O2. It's first order with respect to each of those reactants. Now, here's some values we're given. So at zero degrees Celsius, the K was found to be 2.37 times 10 to the minus five liters per mole second. At 25 degrees Celsius, it's found to be 2.64 times 10 to the minus four liters per mole second. So let's calculate the EA and the A for this reaction using the Arrhenius' equation. So ln K, EA over R, one over T plus ln A. So K1 is 2.37 times 10 to the minus five. K2, 2.64 times 10 to the minus four. And we're gonna plot a graph of ln K versus one over T. And when we do, uh, in order to make the graph, we have to plot some points. So, so what we have to do first is take the ln of K, which is 10.65, K1 here, one over the temperature, while K1, it says, was at 25 degrees Celsius, so one over uh, 298K is 3.66 times 10 to the minus three. Second point, the ln of K, 
2.64 times 10 to the minus 4 is minus 8.24. 1 over t is 3.36 times 10 to the minus 3. So when we plot this graph, what shape should we get? Well, we said it's y equals mx plus b is the form of it. So there are the two points that are plotted. We get a straight line. And the slope is, again, minus ea over r. And since we know r, we can figure out ea if we calculate the slope. Now, how can we calculate that slope? Well, we could use uh, rise over run to figure out that slope, calculate ea. So here's an easier way to do it. We don't have to make a graph. We could just say the ln of k equals minus ea over rt plus ln of a at t2 ln of k2 equals uh, minus ea over r times 1 over t2 plus ln of a. So at t1, ln of k1 is ea over r times 1 over t1 plus the ln of a. So now what we can do is subtract the ln of k1 from k2 and subtract those two terms. And we end up with Arrhenius's equation. So the ln of k2 divided by the ln of k1 is equal to that expression I'm showing you. Okay. So we can use this equation to find k at different temperatures. If we know one k value, we can figure out the other k value as long as we know the two temperatures. Now, if you're given an EA. Now, if you're given K1 and K2, you can find EA, knowing the two temperatures. So pretty useful equation. Again, you'll be given that equation on your information sheet. So to solve a problem, we can use this equation again. So K1 and K2 are given, the ln of K1 over the ln of K2, and I'm just basically following this setup equals EA over R times 1 over T2, take away 1 over T1, and we get a value 2.41. And we can solve for EA by doing the math, and we get a value of 65.2 kilojoules per mole. Again, this is the equation used to find K at different temperatures and is found on the information sheet. So, whoops, sorry, just to reveal the rest of the math here, the ln of those two numbers is 2.41 equals EA over 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. And then we can solve for 1 over 298 minus 1 over 273. Now, go back to Arrhenius's equation to find A. So the ln of k is ea over r times 1 over t plus ln of a. We can solve for a. a is equal to 18.8 .8 by solving it. And so we now can find, since we know the ln of a is 18.08, .08, we know a equals e to the power of 18.08. .08. You can try that for yourself just to make sure using the numbers. So A for this particular example and for this substance is 7.1 times 10 to the power of 7 liters per mole second. So please make sure you include your units. In the above example, activation energy is 65.2 kilojoules per mole. This is the minimum energy required for the reaction to occur. The Arrhenius equation showed us that there is a strong relationship between reaction rate and temperature can better be understood by looking at a maxwell boltzmann distribution curve, which we looked at in 131. So from this distribution curve, you can see we have two temperatures, T1 and T2. T2 is greater than T1. Look what happens to the curve. The kinetic energy, as the temperature increases, the average kinetic energy of the particles is increasing. And again, I remind you, when you consider how, what these curves look like, it would be like if you sat there and watched cars on 
uh, street in the city. Some cars would be going really fast. Um, uh, the fast cars would be at this end. Not very many go really fast because they get busted for speeding. Some people have trouble driving at, at, at reasonable speeds. They drive really slow. But the vast majority of people drive around in Ontario, I would say 10 kilometers over the speed limit. This is the typical speed most people drive. So that if you now change the temperature, it would be analogous to going to a highway that's got a higher speed limit. So now you start looking at um, the 401. Well, there's a few cars going 150, 160 kilometers an hour, not very many of them. Most of the cars are going probably in the 401 about 120 kilometers an hour. And there's a few slow pokes that drive at much slower speeds. So, so temperature increases average kinetic energy of particles. So EA, again, is the minimum energy required to successfully break chemical bonds and form new ones. A small increase in temperature can greatly increase the number of successful collisions. So, so how we show that in the graph is at T1, the substances that were actually successfully colliding were only at this end of the curve, underneath the curve. Where that dotted line is, is the energy of activation. So you can see that as we heat it up and the curve shifts to T2, that the area under the curve is going to dramatically change. So T2, now all of a sudden there's a lot more particles successfully reacting. Whereas at the lower temperature, it was simply the small little area underneath here. So the blue region again, the number of particles successfully colliding at a low temperature, and the red area is the number of particles successfully colliding at a higher temperature. Dramatic increase. That's why we see doubling of reaction rates with a 10 degree Celsius increase in temperature. So now let's take a look at a potential energy curve versus a reaction coordinate which is basically time, but on a really, really quick scale because reactions tend to happen over really, really short periods of time. So in this case, our reactants are NO2 and CO, and our products are NO and CO2. So um, there's an oxygen atom that is simply being exchanged between molecules. So the energy of activation is 132 kilojoules per mole for the forward reaction. If it's an equilibrium in a closed container, then in the reverse reaction, notice the energy of activation is much higher. It's 358 kilojoules per mole for NO and CO2 molecules to collide and reform NO2 and CO. So to better understand why minimum energy is required for the reaction to proceed, I want you to consider the following. So in this part of the curve, the molecule's energy is increasing. As the molecules increase, the molecules tend to get stretched out. They're storing energy as it's stretched out, much like an elastic band that you're pulling on. You're starting to store energy as you pull the elastic band one end away from the other. And on the other side, it's like the elastic band is shrinking. When you stretch it and let it go, it starts to shrink and it's releasing energy. So now, exactly what happens when the particles are fall ap far apart, um, there isn't much of anything happening. But as you increase their temperature, their uh, potential energy goes up, and the potential energy curve begins to rise. <clears throat> so the maximum potential energy associated with the activated complex is up here. Now, if the particles don't have enough energy, if they don't get to that activated complex where bonds are being stretched, new bonds might be starting to form at that, act, at that activated complex. Uh, again, the activation energy is there. What happens if the molecules don't quite get to that activated complex? They will simply uh, lower their energy, will be lowered, and then they will go back to the state that they started from. They didn't achieve that activated complex. Unsuccessful collisions, as you saw in that example I showed you earlier, don't result in chemical reactions. No bond breaking or bond making. Now, if a reaction does proceed, the molecules have to collide with enough energy at the right angle to 
to actually cause bonds to stretch to the point where they start to break. And then new bonds start to form. And we can actually successfully create product molecules. So the forward activation energy in this case would be 132 kilojoules per mole, which is a distance from here to here. And the reverse activation energy for NO and CO2 to collide and produce NO2 and CO is 358 kilojoules per mole. The change in internal energy that's happened in this system would be minus 226 kilojoules per mole. On this graph, they use delta E. We in this course have been using delta U to represent internal energy change. Okay? And there is, so it's the difference between the, um, the energy it started with and the energy it finished. It's a negative quantity because it's products minus reactants. So rates of all elementary reactions will increase as temperature as well as the rate constants. So the rates of non-elementary reactions may not increase with temperature, however. So let's explain. So we looked at uh, a uh, rapid equilibrium in a first step reaction followed by a slower step. So, and for this mechanism, the overall K is, is the equilibrium constant K1 times the rate, K, the rate uh, constant of K2 the product of that equilibrium constant from step one and the rate constant from step two. So sometimes an increase in temperature will cause an equilibrium constant to, to uh, decrease faster than the rate constant K2 increases and the overall rate will drop. This, let's consider this example for this kind of mechanism. So we have uh, nitrogen monoxide and oxygen reacting to form nitrogen dioxide and heat so uh, we looked at this earlier, a possible reaction mechanism. Two molecules of nitrogen monoxide collide to make dinitrogen dioxide plus heat. Notice this is uh, intermediate. It's not found in the overall equation. But this particular step reaches equilibrium very quickly, followed by a much slower step. So the NO2, N2O2 will accumulate, and it won't be used up because this rate is very slow. So N2O2 in the second step collides with oxygen and produces NO2. So the overall rate we can uh, arrive at by simply canceling the uh, dinitrogen dioxide on both sides. And it, the rate is determined by the slowest step. So this step will determine the rate. So a rate mechanism or a rate equation would be R equals K times concentration of N2O2 times concentration of O2. But here's the problem. There's an intermediate in that equation. We can't have a rate expression that's got an intermediate. So we have to somehow get rid of that intermediate. How is that done? Well, we'll get to that. <clears throat> so the equation, equation one, has a, has a K value, K1 of the concentration of NO2 divided by the concentration of NO squared. So I'm looking at this first step here. Therefore, the concentration of NO2, really, if I rearrange this equation, we're going to say the concentration of N2O2 is equal to K1 times NO squared. So now, that's equation two. What if we substitute equation two and equation one? So instead of the concentration of N2O2 being in this equation one, we're going to put K times NO squared in equation number one in the substitution. So basically, we're going to take that out and replace it. So we now have a rate expression that doesn't have an intermediate in it. Now, if we increase the temperature, what's going to happen? Well, if we increase the temperature, we can take a look here at this equation. There, heat is on the right-hand side. If we increase temperature, Le Chatelier's principle says the equilibrium or the system will shift to get rid of what's added. So if we add heat, the equilibrium or the system will shift to get rid of the added heat. So the, the product side, the right side is going to decrease if that happens. And the reactant side or left side is going to increase. Well, if the equilibrium constant is, is concentration of NO2 squared divided by the concentration of NO squared times concentration of O2, 
then obviously that number is going to go down as we increase the heat. Okay. Just to show you with the arrows, the equilibrium, the system, I should say, is going to shift until a new equilibrium is reached by decreasing the NO2 content and increasing those two contents. So if the increase in temperature causes the equilibrium constant to de decrease faster than the rate constant K2, then the overall rate of the reaction will indeed drop. So the suggested homework after this lesson is to read Petrucci and to study an example in the book and then to do those questions. And always, please, success depends on working hard. Six, only um, success is achieved with hard work. So it, it's been a pleasure communicating with you. Bye for now.